Far east of the Sword Coast, the Shadowvar and Discoverin have fallen. The Shadow Storm is no more. Sembia is fractured into city-states. A mysterious hero rises from the ashes to usher in a new era of prosperity. Yet there is still suffering. Cormir and the wild elves of the Dale Lands offer war on all sides. Earth motes, madness, and shadow dragons plague the lands. These are the tales of the heroes who ended that suffering. 1491 DR, the year of Sembian revival. Welcome everybody to another long-winded one. Uh, with me tonight, I have an author from the Sembia Gateway to the Realms novels. Um, he has written over 50 novels. He's written short stories, uh, some in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, some in the world of Marvel, uh, some in the world of Lovecraft. Um, he has taught fiction at, a co at the college level. Um, he is a fellow Ohioan, uh, like like me, um, but like me, has not been back there in, <laughs> in many years. Um, with me tonight is the author, Richard Lee Byers. Welcome to the podcast, Richard. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. Of course, the reason we're we're speaking with you um, after having talked to Phil Athens and uh, Clayton Emery is because we are focusing on Forgotten Realms and specifically Sembia. So is it is it safe to say that you have written uh, close to around 30 stories uh, and or novels for Forgotten Realms? That sounds about right. If you if you take I haven't gone back and counted them, but if you take all the novels and all the contributions to anthologies and a couple of things that, that were in Dragon Magazine. That's probably around 30. Gosh. Okay. And how far back are we going? Oh, God. I didn't know there was going to be math. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I got involved around 2000, maybe. Um, whenever um, whenever my Symbia book came out, whenever the Symbia series got started, you know, it wasn't very long at all before then. I think what happened was I had contacted Phil and um, asked about the possibility of writing uh, in the realms. And he s said, well, we're putting together this um, anthology called uh, Realms of Mystery. And why don't you send me a, a story for that? And if, uh, you know, if we, I like it, we'll use it. And then maybe that will lead to other things. So I did one and uh, it did get in the book. And not too long after that, they had the... Um, I don't know if contest is exactly the right word, but it was like kind of a open call. Like if you want to be a Forgotten Realms novelist, um, you know, we're going to do this Symbia series with featuring Ed Greenwood plus a bunch of new writers. And uh, this is the, this is the part of the realms that's going to be set in. These are the characters, pick one of these characters and uh, do a pitch. So um, I did, uh, I picked uh, Shammer, and who was the matriarch of the family and mm -hmm. uh, did a, uh, a pitch for her and uh, landed the assignment to do the Shattered Mask and all my other realm stuff, you know, flowed from that. I wanted to ask you about Shammer. So when, in talking with Phil, he mentioned that out of all the other authors, you may have had the most difficult time with your character, uh, and that's uh, Shammer Uskevrin, the the matriarch, and that's because she had some written history somewhere. Was it in a box set? Uh, yeah, it was. For, it was some some sort of little source book or module somewhere where they had a page about her, and it was. Um, and interestingly enough, it, it had her. Uh, it, that information was set like a uh, hundred years before the Sembia series was going to be set. So I was like, okay, how is she still around? <laughs> so that was the, uh, that was the first thing I had to deal with. And then, um, and which I did by basically and at that point, I don't know if, the, if this is still the case, but at that point there was like a, a rule that we weren't going to have any time travel in the realms. I guess they'd had it at some point, but previously they didn't like it. And uh, so there's no time travel. So I thought, well, that eliminates one thing, but I could put her in hibernation, right? Yeah, and, sure. Uh, so that was what I did. Then the other thing I had to deal with was that, um, was that uh, she, you know, she was the, uh, the matriarch of this noble merchant house in, um, 
in the in the Symbius series, but in the um, the pre existing material, she had been a rogue. So I had to explain why she was uh, playing this uh, matriarchal role now when she had this uh, background as an adventuress and the uh, kind of the tension between those two things and the fact that she really wanted to be an adventuress but felt that she could was what uh, was was what drove the book on a character level. Well, I, I really liked um, her evolution. And, um, and in fact, the evolution that happens between her and the old Al, uh, the, the patriarch of the family, Thamelin, and, uh, and how they kind of have to work together. I, I don't want to give anything away for people who haven't read the novels. Yeah, they, they, she starts out not loving him. It was a kind of a forced marriage. And uh, and and comes to love him as it goes on. I also I also got the, the the three kids in there. I don't know. I just wanted to do scenes with every character, and uh, I, I I nearly got there. I've got Aramis in there, but not really doing anything substantive. Um, this this leads me to my next question, um, and that's you know talking about these other characters. Uh, how much interaction did you have with the some of these other authors, the the authors that wrote these characters? Right, uh, Dave Gross wrote both brothers, uh, along with Kate, Clayton Emery. Um, so, did were you able to? Uh, you know, Clayton mentioned um, sort of talking about what Selgot was like and and what these merchant nobles' lives were like, and he he said he he talked with some of the other authors. Were you a part of those conversations? Um. There was some communication. There may have been um, there may have been more communication between or among some of the other authors than there was between me and the other authors. I kind of, um, I mean, I kind of from the right of the write ups, I kind of felt like I knew who the the characters were supposed to be, and I also felt like um, I knew what Sembia was supposed to be and what the merchant houses were going to be. Cause it was, you know, it's kind of like Renaissance Italy, right? You know, and I mean, I, I, you know, I, I kind of knew a little bit about, you know, the Medici and, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet and stuff like that. So, uh, I, I didn't feel like I had to be shooting off emails every day to everybody else. And, but, I, but there definitely was some communication. Well, do you have, I'm curious, um, Phil had a copy of his story Bible. Do you, do you keep those sorts of things, um, from your writing projects? It's, it's around here somewhere for sure. <laughs> I, even though, even though I'm not, haven't done anything in the realms in years, I've got all my, all my realms reference material is kind of stacked up on my computer desk here. So I'm sure if I rummaged through it, I would find that. I, I, you know, I think as, as fans, we would love to see some of that material published, you know, all, all of the, all of the resource materials that went into these, these novels and these, these modules, you know, that would be fantastic. Well, most of it is, um, is not specific, um, you know, a nice specific little, uh, reference that you get that's particular to a um, certain project generally speaking it's like um, let's say you're writing about the moon sea right it's like okay you're writing about the moon sea go dig through all these source books and find out what they all say about the moon sea uh, it's, a little, it, it, it's not always that way but it's 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 kind of like that yeah well well let's let's talk a, a little bit more about some of your other writings and i guess the first question about that i wanted to ask you was <laughs> you're extremely prolific um you know and and not just novels but short stories and chapter books and um you know, you like we we've talked about. You've written for anthologies and different collections and journals. Did you always know that you wanted to become a writer? I, you know, I know you started off uh, your career in in sort of the mental health profession, but but did you know? I mean, for me, I knew. You know, I had this this desire to create. Did you feel that early on? I really did. Then I got some advice, which is both very sound advice, but also for me was not helpful advice. If 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 you can. You know, if you could kind of deal with the paradox of being good advice, but bad advice at the same time. I, I had heard over and over again from all these people about how hard it is to make a living as a fiction writer, which is true. But um, so what that made me think is, well, I'll have like a real profession and then I'll write on the side. So I went and I thought, well, the mental health field will be interesting and it'll have uh some applicability to when I'm trying to create fictional characters and motivate them 
convincingly and stuff like that. So I, I went into psychology and wound up working in this uh, emergency uh, psychiatric facility where they would bring people that had psychotic breaks or uh, you know tried to commit suicide. And we would attempt to stabilize them and get them back out into the community. Anyway, I found the work to be so draining that when I came home, I didn't really want to write, so I didn't. And uh, as the years passed, I got more and more burnt out on uh, the mental health field for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, then my mom passed away and left me a little money. It was, you know, not enough to live on opulently, but it was enough to live on modestly. And I thought, well, if I'm ever going to really try to be a writer, you know, this is it. I need to do either quit my job and try it now with this being supported by this money or I need to... Um, be honest with myself and say, I'm never going to do it. And so I quit and I tried to write. And, uh, you know, a couple years after that, I sold, uh, I sold by, by, by made my first professional sale and things have kind of gone on from there. That's going to be a great feeling. Uh, my wife and I talk about writing and all the time and we both love to read and she's, she's a big fan of Stephen King. And I, you know, from what I understand, he, he writes about writing a lot and, and sort of how he handles his own writing. It, is it true that you have to, um, you can't just write when you're inspired, but that you have to actually sit down and, and treat it like a profession where you write so many hours a day? Well, I think that that's definitely true unless you're, uh, you know, you reach the lofty heights of the profession where, you know, whenever you do turn out a book, it's going to, you're going to make so much money on that particular book that uh, it doesn't matter if you aren't inspired to come back for a, a couple of years and write another one. If, if you're at a more modest level of the profession, which is where most of us are and certainly where I am, you, um, you, you do need to write on a regular schedule. You just need to be able to sit down and do it on a regular basis. You, you mentioned so many hours a day. That's, that's one way to do it. Uh, the other way to do it is to uh, have a quota of words per day, and which is the way I do it. Uh, can I ask what that is? Well, it, it, it has varied a little bit sometimes in, in response to um, deadlines, you know, where it's like, you know, you can have this gig if you can turn in a story or a book by such and such a date. And then you, you do the math and you figure out, oh, I got to do more than 1,500 words a day to, to do that. So I will. But my normal production is 1500 new words a day and that uh in addition to that i'll be going over the last few days of work polishing it up you know kind of planning what what comes next that's interesting i i know that um from from what i understand uh, again i'm i'm <laughs> i'm not a writer i'm an aspiring writer uh but from what i understand it's it's hard sometimes to go back and look at things that you've written recently you know people tend to be pretty self-critical yeah, well, again, it you know it's, every writer is different. There are some people that it would be very. There's some people that you know find that the best way to do it is to, uh, you know, just burn through that first draft, but when not go back and polish or fix anything, and uh, then you know you'll um, when the whole story's done, then you'll start doing the fixing and the polishing on a second pass. For me, it's um, for me it really helps to. Um, tinker and, and polish as I go. In fact, when I have the story in my mind, if I know that there's something back there that needs to be fixed, I find it difficult to move forward until I've done the fixing. Well, let me ask you, um, so you've written in all of these worlds, and I know you say said you, you hadn't written for Forgotten Realms uh, for a long time, but but I, but I'm sure that you there are you know multiple universes that you're writing in. But let let me ask you about that. Is it is it hard to be in two different worlds, like say that of Marvel and that of you know uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Forgotten Realms, possibly? Um, or can can you do that? Can you can you write in multiple universes, or do you have to sort of focus on one genre or one realm at a time? I, I don't have any trouble uh, working in mobile universes as long as I'm only really writing one story at a time. Ah, I mean, I okay. could write a Forgotten Realms story and turn right around and write a uh, Marvel story or, or whatever. Or, but uh, it, it, it's become somewhat more difficult, although it is doable, if somehow 
the deadlines have fallen in a way that I have to uh, be working on two stories simultaneously. That that that's I haven't had to do that in a long while, but it, it's tricky. But I can think back to a couple times when I was writing one novel in the daytime and one novel in the evening. You know, it's like, okay, which character, which book is this character in? Oh. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's actually why I asked the question because I can imagine how difficult that would be. Yeah, it isn't really too bad if you're if you're deeply invested in your stories i think it's like you should uh i mean you should probably ha- do a lot of thinking and reflecting on your stories when you're not actually at the computer i think i mean <laughs> not because you're trying but it, it just it just should just sort of be happening yeah because you're sunk that deeply into what you're doing but what's interesting for me is as you'll as the you know snatches of dialogue will come to me Mm-hmm. And I'll think, you know, that's perfect. That's just what they would say. And it illuminates this particular uh, issue or whatever perfectly. I'm going to use that. And then it never winds up really quite fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the fact that uh, the fact that those things are coming to me shows that my brain is in, engaged enough with the material. Let's talk. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about this. This is going to be, I don't know, a funny question probably. but. Being an author uh, is probably a lot like being a parent in some ways. Um, and I, I don't know if, if you're able to sort of pick your favorite creation, right? Uh, much like that the age-old question for parents, can, you can't really pick your favorite kid. Uh, but if you had to, um, what what is the first thing that someone should pick up from Richard Lee Byers? And, and you know, please use this as an opportunity to talk about, you know, non-TSR, Wizards of the Coast stuff. Well, I'm really uh, pleased with um, the Marvel Legends of Asgard novel I just came out with most recently, which is called uh, The Head of Mimir, for uh, anybody who wants to go look it up. It's set in the uh, Marvel Comics universe, and uh, it's, uh, you know, early times in Asgard. It shows how uh, some of the uh, characters that uh, and in situations that people might know from, you know, contemporary Thor comics or whatever – you know, got their start and evolved towards being what they are. Hmm. Um, as far as my realm stuff, um, the last books I did were my uh, Fey trilogy, which is what is it? It's Undead, Unholy, and Unsomething. Not Uncola. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, that, that that and then that's from that way spun off into um, my Brotherhood of the Griffin books, which uh, where that that's a series. Sadly, it just kind of stops because the the all forgotten realms novels just kind of stop. Well, anyway, that's 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 enough. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm curious. Uh, so you you mentioned some some Lovecraft. Fiction, yeah, I've, I've got um, I've I've haven't ever written a full length Lovecraftian story, but I have written um, some shorter pieces. I collected them. Um, what I consider to be kind of my best ones in a book called um, the the Hepcats of Ulthar. And other Lovecraftian sto- stories, which you know you can find on Amazon, mm-hmm. and that's that, that's a really good selection of my uh, of my Lovecraftian stuff. I also did a uh, a couple uh, novellas that are Lovecraftian. They're based they're based on, on the specifically on the Arkham Horror game. Mm-hmm. If people are familiar with that from Fantasy Flight Games, but uh, you don't have to have any familiarity with uh, the actual board game to read those. You just have to uh, enjoy, you know, cosmic horror. I'm, I am curious if if you have experience uh, role playing, uh, you know, either now or when you were younger. Um, did, did that help? Um, you know, it helps so many people sort of develop their their imagination and and um, it gives them that that love to create that we talked about earlier. Well, I started playing D and D way back when it was three beige pamphlets in a white cord- cardboard box. Mm-hmm. And you could buy it at the, at the hobby store for 10 bucks. And they even threw in crappy, as I've said, a crappy dice with it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a life, I'm pretty much a lifelong role-playing gamer, but you know, I don't know that it necessarily shaped my writing that much because I was a, uh, devoted reader and a fantasy fan before I got into D&D. I mean, that was why I got into D&D. 
So, you know, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily drew or needed a lot of help from that source. Sure. In talking with you um, bef- before this whole interview, I, I kind of found out about your your you had a, a hobby that that was interesting to me, um, which which I would imagine uh, feeds a lot of your sword f- you know sword play knowledge in your novels, and that's and that's your fencing hobby or your past fencing hobby. Um, could you talk to us about kind of how that came about? Well, yeah, I got um, I was uh, I think it was for a birthday. I was given a uh, gift certificate to uh to go for a, a month of lessons at a uh a local fencing club because some somebody knew that i had enjoyed sword and sorcery fiction and i enjoyed uh swashbuckling fiction and movies like the three musketeers i thought well, okay well this would be a good present for him so mm-hmm. i went and i did it and i really loved it and i stuck with it for about uh, 25 years i got um got to be uh kind of semi good with Epe fair with um foil and not very good at all with saber but i did all three and yeah it, you definitely um learn things about um you know things about combat that uh, will help you uh do fighting scenes things about uh distance and how sword play really works and things like that of course uh modern sport fencing partly because the weapons are so light and partly because you're not really gonna hurt your opponent or trying to hurt your opponent is not the same as historical sword play. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it, if somebody really wants to, uh, write convincingly about, uh, you know, two guys wailing on each other with, uh, you know, with, with broadswords, you, you want to look farther than just, um, modern, uh, electric, you know, fencing or whatever. So, you know, I've read a fair amount about, uh, actual, sword play and things like that too and i also i did um back when i was in graduate school i was in the uh, karate club for a couple of years and you know you you, you draw on what you remember of that it, it's it's pretty much like anything else um you know the, the more you know about it the more it helps you to write about it sure can i ask you about um so you, you mentioned some of this something that you're working on now could, could you tell us maybe um what you have coming up, what we could be on the lookout for from you? Oh, gee, I wish I could. I, I just found out that something I wrote has been pushed back because the particular publisher is um, had challenges falling upon the pandemic. You know, the pandemic was bad for certain, at least some publishers because it, um, you know, it affected, uh, you know, production. It affected distribution. By affecting distribution, it affects you know, new revenue and new revenue is what pays for, you know, printing new projects and stuff like that. So I have a, I have a, a books, a superhero book that's set in the uh, mutants and masterminds universe called uh, the doom that came to San Francisco. And I'm sure, sure it will be out eventually, but I thought it was going to be out this month and it's not. So, but you know, I, I, you know, we'll watch for it on the horizon is all I can really say. The thing I'm working on now is um, I'm one of the writers that contributes to a uh, series of uh, stories uh, about uh, two guys called Basil and Mobius who are kind of uh, kind of like modern day Fawford and Gray Bowser. They're uh, mm-hmm. two two thieves that get uh, involved in all these uh, all these situations that involve. Uh, the supernatural and fringe science and urban legends as they wind up going after all these, you know, kind of bizarre objects. For, and uh, I've been doing, I've been doing working on those for quite a while. All right. Well, I don't suppose there's any chance that uh, there's any uh, forgotten realms novels uh, coming from, from you anytime soon, huh? No, I, I would love to do more. I had all kind of plans for, things i mean if you like i said if you've read um brotherhood of the griffin you know that um you know you know that it it, it there are uh, subplots that run through those books that don't get resolved well they were gonna get resolved but there are but then they took well we aren't doing any more of those books and um and if you read uh year of rogue dragons there are a couple characters that are in there who are uh very long lived for because of their their something other than you know human beings and uh you know they were eventually going to show up again so um you know i i i've still 
regret that uh, I, I'm not getting to tell those stories, and I definitely regret uh, the the subplots that never, uh, you know, the readers never got to see resolved. I wouldn't have done that if I knew the book line was going to stop. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I, I think the same thing happened. Um, we talked before we pushed record on the pl- podcast about, um, you know, Paul Kemp's novels and how he had, he had sort of more planned for Vase and Kale, Erevis's son. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the Godborn came out, but I think there he would, he was planning two more novels, I believe after that. Um, so I think a lot of fans were disappointed by that decision to, to kill the, uh, the novel line. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, all of us were, um, you know, all of us who were who were there at that point had uh, probably had more to tell. I, I guess Erin Evans kind of wrapped up her thing about the Tieflings, but I bet she had more realm stories she was going to tell. And of course, you know, Ed Greenwood did. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and does, and you know, of course, Bob Salvatore is is, is the one of us who is uh, is actually getting to continue with Drizzt. So. There is a little realms fiction out there. I don't want to. I wouldn't want it to get back to Bob, but I said there wasn't any because there certainly is. And uh, you know, so everybody that wants a, a good fix of Drizzt could get that periodically. Well, before we go, I, I thought we could do something fun real quick. Um, and this is a surprise to you. Didn't know this was coming, but I, I, I wanted to. We'll do like a lightning round. I'll, I'll, I'll say a quick question, and you can give me like a one word answer. Um, like, we'll, we'll, I'll say. Um, what is your favorite area in the realms? Uh, to to write, um, I'll say Fay. To um, to play, I don't know. I've never actually gamed in the realms. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've only written about it. All right, then. How about your favorite um, favorite villain from the realms? Uh, Saz Tom, who's the villain right. in my Fay trilogy. And um, to to sort of take it home with our our focus area, favorite part of Sembia? Oh, gee, um, God, you you know how long it's been since I wrote those stories, right? <laughs> it's uh, been about twenty years, right? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna say I'm gonna say, I really like kind of that uh, kind of that uh, quasi Shakespearean theater. There's a quasi Shakespearean uh, theater, right? I'm not confusing this with something else. <laughs> Well, there's a, um, I mean, Talbot, you know, yeah, yes, yeah, he, right, yeah, right. yeah, Talbot and Selgant. So we'll go with Selgant on that one. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, you mean, oh, we just, if you only needed a town with Selgant, sure. <laughs> Selgant's the place to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other part? <laughs> My book was set in Selgant. <laughs> well, you know, what's fun about this podcast is, um, this podcast is focused on a campaign that I ran after reading all of those novels, the, the gateway to, to the realms novels. And, um, you know, I, I, I borrow ideas as, as an homage to, to th- these stories. Um, you know, something that's coming up soon there, there's going to be a tressum right. From, uh, from one of the novels there's, you know, we talk about, um, you know, the wild elves, we, and then we go from city to city. So we talk about Dare Loon and we talk about, you know, s- some of these towns have only been briefly mentioned in like a dragon magazine 20 years ago, you know? So there's a, there's a, there's a lot to write and, and there's a lot to sort of craft and, and to shape. And, and what we're trying to do here with the podcast is, is, you know, give people some NPCs that they can use in their own campaigns or, you know, describe uh, a, a particular aspect of a town that they can then roll into their campaign. Yeah. I remember when I was, I remember the one that we, they were putting the Sembia project together the starting point was that kind of Sembia had been this um, kingdom where they had deliberately not done anything. Yeah. So, um, so players or so game masters could, uh, you know, kind of create what, here's the area where you can do any crazy thing you want to do. Yeah. And then they, they had a change of heart and said, well, let's start filling in Sembia. So um, the things that you're mentioning are things that, you know, I, I honestly don't remember anymore, but uh they might not even have been filled in at all when uh, when we when we started writing the semi novels. They might have just said, "Here's Selgon, you know, go go with that." Yeah, yeah. Well, I notice every once in a while a town will show up in a not like you mentioned Aaron Evans. Um, you know, I I um, I hadn't read her Tiefling novels. Um, however, I did pick up the one focused in Cormier. 
because my next campaign takes place in Cormier, right? So, um, they, you know, I think things like that happen where a novel will sort of randomly cover a town or, <laughs> or a town near a, a big city. Yeah, you have to, um, you know, kind of fish around in, in a setting like that, fish around and decide where you're going to set your story. And, um, and a lot of times you want to set it where um, there hasn't been a ton of stuff to keep track of already established that make can make life easier, particularly if you're like a newcomer to that particular shared world. Yeah. Uh, you, I, you know, I wouldn't recommend if the, we were still doing forgotten realms novels, I wouldn't recommend that anybody's first forgotten realms novel be set in water deep. Well, it's funny because, you know, I think what you, you all were trying to do with the gateway to the realms novels uh, as an entry point for people who just were just overwhelmed with water deep and Baldur's gate and all of that. Um, it was a really good thing. And it, it, it's actually why this campaign took place in Symbia because, you know, I didn't play all of those video games about Baldur's gate. You know, I didn't, I didn't read all of those novels about water deep, you know, I, so, um, it, it was a, it was a place that I could go and be true to the world, but, but not have to, you know, do all of this research. So. Yeah, I, well, I think the same thing was true of us who who were, you know, fledgling realms novelists at that point. You know that they they were kind to us to give us the give us a, you know this relatively uh, you know circumscribed uh, playground and you know like know about this and you don't really have to know about Waterdeep and the Sword Coast and et cetera and et cetera. Well, gosh. Thank you. We I've chatted your ear off for 40 minutes, um, and I really appreciate you being here. Well, I'm glad to do it. I enjoyed it. You, there's a lot that you're you're putting out, so we'll be on the lookout for it. And you're active on Twitter, so um, if people are interested in what's going on with you, can they can they follow you on Twitter? Yeah, they can definitely follow me on Twitter. I'm mean, more active on Facebook, actually, if people want to follow me there, too. Well, excellent. Ha- have a great night. Though this marks the end of the episode, the tale continues within a 10-day. Join us at longwinded.one and consider giving us a review on Apple Music, Spotify, or really whichever platform you choose.